Okay, so I'd like for you all to meet my son, Jeremy. This was just an afternoon at my house. He comes over and spends the night once a week, usually Friday nights. And um, this was, I believe, on a Saturday morning. And um, he was just in a really good mood. And so I decided to get capture that moment and share it with you all. You'll see him also doing different things with his hands. He's doing sign language with me because of the um, non nonverbal. We've been able to teach him a few signs. So he's, um, I'll go ahead and tell you, he is the youngest of my first four children and he has the most, he is the most severe of all four of them on the autism spectrum. But I don't think autism is usually a very appropriate Did word. I use it in forms like this because it's relatable. But um, heavy metal toxicity is really a better definition of what is going on here. Oh, here comes Lily. Yes, in 1986, the National Vaccine Compensation Act was implemented by Ronald, President Ronald Reagan, which um, basically took away liability and accountability to the vaccine makers. Um, where it made it virtually impossible. I mean, there were a few cases after that, court cases, but it made it virtually impossible to take a vaccine maker or a doctor or pediatrician um, to court for vaccine injury to a child when the result is autism. And it was autism specific, correct? Yes, he got, he, he received double the vaccines. Um, when I was growing up, we got maybe eight shots. Um, kids today can get up to f about, I think it's 56 was the last count, and that's not including flu shots. In here, uh, flu shots are still loaded with thimerosal, and they will say that there's no thimerosal in other vaccines, but there are traces. There is no regulation on how much is in a trace, and you can actually get a full dose. Also, um, these vaccines, if you have a lab tech that will shake the bottle first and mix it all up, you'll get more thimerosal and <coughs> pig blood and human DNA and formaldehyde and all of that in your shot. So they, they put the thimerosal in like DPT and they put aluminum and MMR and they do that because they're multi-dose vaccines Okay, and then the next one was just a few weeks ago. Um, I was taking, can you all hear me without the mic okay? I, I'm loud. Um, I was taking him home, and it was a good visit. He was calm. He was happy during the visit. But the next thing happened, just all of a sudden, taking him home. He only lives like 15 minutes from me. And um, it was going on for so long that I, um, I thought I needed to record it. For one, I, I thought he was going to come over the seat after me. And it needed to be known why we had a wreck. But I also just thought it needed to be documented. So.
I, I know that was hard to watch, but um, a few people messaged me and said that was hard to watch and I couldn't watch all of it, but I forced myself to because you can't turn it off. So I just um, thought it would kind of make you just feel maybe a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So um, the story I'm about to tell you is not only mine. It is also the story of my children and countless other children and their families. It is a story that begins with parents seeking only to protect and care for their children to their fullest capacity. But this is not only a story. It is a warning alarm. This concerns the trust factor between a doctor and their patient. Here is my story. Right after high school, I married my high school sweetheart. He then went straight into the Air Force and we found ourselves stationed in Missouri with full access to hospitals and doctors as back then, dependents had full coverage. 14 months later, in September of 1986, our first child was born, a daughter, Catherine. She was beautiful and healthy, and her development was normal and on schedule. Two years later, in December of 1988, our second child was born, a son that we named Daniel. Daniel was also born healthy, and his development was on schedule. It was around this time that President Ronald Reagan signed the National Vaccine Compensation Act that created a vaccine court and protected vaccine manufacturers from liability and accountability, thus removing the incentive for producing safe vaccines. This is something I had never even heard being reported in the news at that time. Pediatricians at the base hospital never mentioned it. In 1990, while pregnant with my third child, my sister-in-law gave me a book, How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. And that author's name was Robert S. Mendelson. That book described how standard medical procedures are more often harmful to the patient and a conditioning process, more and more medical care, that did more to line the pockets of doctors and the drug companies than it did to benefit the patients. It warned against vaccinations, stressing that's not how you build a healthy immune system. After reading the book, I discussed it with my husband. I shared with him the information and we decided we would no longer vaccinate our children. <clears throat> a firestorm from our local network family ensued, especially from our close family who beat us down with guilt that if something would happen to our children, we would be the ones guilty and responsible. They accused the author of the book saying he was not to be relied upon as he was rather an oddball and not to be trusted. After many nights of deliberation, my husband and I decided we would indeed vaccinate our children. Our third child, Joshua, was born in 1990. And then in 15 months later, our fourth child, another son, Jeremy, who you just saw, was born in 1991. The younger two received twice as many vaccines as the first two. As we already described, they increased the vaccine schedule at that time. Everything seemed fine for a while. We believed we were seeing normal development. It was shortly after the birth of Jeremy that my husband was sent TDY to South Korea for a year. It was during his leave when the symptoms of autism started to emerge in the older two children. Catherine started kindergarten. Her teacher contacted me after the first week of school with a list of questions. Catherine was exhibiting an inability to fall within routine and she was hypersensitive to noise. Soon afterwards, our son Daniel started hand flapping and echolalia. My community around me started telling me that the symptoms looked autistic. I had never heard of autism before. Apparently back then, one in 10,000 children had autism. Then about a year and a half later, my younger two boys, who had started to speak, gradually stopped speaking. I can remember taking them to the doctor, asking questions of the symptoms that I was seeing, and the doctors had no idea what was going on. I continued to make deliberate appointments with every pediatrician, repeatedly given the same answer. 
the best they could do was to promise that they will just keep an eye on things and see where, what they're doing at their next appointment, which was usually a year later. That wasn't good enough for me, but back then, it was 1994, we did not have the internet. You could not just go online and find information. So I started taking the younger two in for speech therapy, counseling, anything available to me. In 1995, I took my children to the Child Study Center in Fort Worth, Texas and had a team evaluation done to diagnose my children's behavior. Several weeks later, we got the call from the lead pediatrician that all four were indeed on the autism spectrum. I remember sitting in my bedroom on the phone crying as he told me what life was going to be like as each child of mine grew up to adulthood and how difficult things would be. I could feel myself going into a state of denial that somehow things would not be that way for my children, that I would, make, that I would find a way to make it better. He suggested I take my children to see an internal medicine pediatrician to get the best care possible. I was in my mid-twenties at the time and did whatever the doctors told me. That was the absolute worst thing I could have done, but it would take years of learning the hard way to realize that. Within a year, I moved back home to Kansas City, divorced and on my own with four children. The younger two were placed by the school district in a CBD classroom, which stood for Communication and Behavior Disorder. It was basically a self-contained autistic class. I kept hoping for results with my children, but they never came. Joshua, who had lost speech, ended up regaining speech, but Jeremy, the youngest, never regained his speech. To this day, he's 25 years old, and he still cannot speak. When he turned six years old, Jeremy started biting his arms and hands. I would wrap them and layer clothing over them and do everything I could to protect his arms from him, but it was to no avail. Then came the high risk for flight, and let me tell you about that. There was not any lock that could keep him contained. Jeremy would watch for the opportunity and whenever any caregiver, whether it be me or a teacher or a grandparent, would turn their back for even a second, he would be out the door and running down the street. Then started intestinal issues from leaky gut. Never did the doctor suggest a nutritionist or changing the diet in any way, shape or form. They only wanted to mask his symptoms with more and more pharmaceutical medications. When the medication would stop working, they would either increase it or switch to something else. I would often hear them say, let's revisit an old medication and see if it works better now. It was insanity. In 1997, I remarried to a man who had never been married or had any children of his own. He wanted to have children, but I was too afraid. For years I had been hearing from random people, let alone friends and family, that four children with autism probably meant something genetic was going on. But there was no family history on my side or their dad's. We looked at every possible angle and couldn't find any link to what could possibly be going wrong now. I suspected the vaccines, but the doctors kept shooting that down. It was like any time I would question the vaccines, the doctor would be quick to dismiss me and explain it in whatever way they could and push hard for the vaccine. What I didn't realize is that doctors had an incentive to complete the vaccine schedule. There is a financial and monetary reward to fulfill that agenda. Pediatricians are attacked by regulation, especially recently through Obamacare. The Hippocratic Oath of do no harm is supposed to apply to the patient. Pediatricians were forgetting that the most important thing that they will ever hear is the first thing their patients tell them. It was around 2002 when I finally started finding some information on the internet that pertained to what was happening to my family. None of them were on any official medical websites. They were message boards of pa parents describing loss of development in their children, the same thing I was experiencing with my children. In 2004, my second husband and I had our daughter Genevieve and we made sure she did not receive any vaccines. We received some pushback at first, but having four children on the spectrum 
and with the research I was doing, the doctors were really not armed enough or informed enough to argue with me about it, and the ones I encountered for the most part gave up and kicked us out as patients. But it wasn't long before I found a doctor who would allow me to delay the immunization schedule. Then two years later, in 2006, my son Sean was born. Again, no vaccinations for him. The nurse that would come in and check on us in the hospital when he was born would secretly tell me that she thought I was doing the right thing, but not to mention it to the other nurses. The plan was when Genevieve would reach the age of five, we would start and would start school, we would get her just a few vaccinations in a single dose. What I didn't realize is that doctors really won't do that. Then in 2007, my son Jeremy received the Tdap and our lives fell apart. His pediatrician said he needed that for school and it was in a thimerosal free pre-filled syringe. This was the final blow to Jeremy's immune system. Our world crashed and we realized that no vaccine was safe at any time ever. When I reported the adverse reaction to his pediatrician, she informed me there was still mercury, otherwise known as thimerosal, in trace amounts in the vaccine. And there's no regulation on how much is in a trace. I can still hear her voice telling me she was convinced he got a full dose of thimerosal. So Jeremy was what convinced us, and Genevieve and Sean were spared and never received even one vaccine. Jeremy's development and behavior deteriorated and spiraled out of control from the Tdap vaccine. He was having over 20 grand mal seizures a week. He had become so aggressive that he had to be placed in a temporary facility for protection of those of us in the home from his aggression. He would have screaming rages and lash out and attack. He could not communicate with us to tell us what was wrong and the violence had escalated to the point where he couldn't be in our home. He was placed at Lake Mary, a residential facility that cares for children under 18 in distress. That was the only thing we could find in this desperate and volatile situation, and I hated every minute of it. Every day was filled with fear and anxiety of wondering how he was being treated. My daughter Genevieve and I would take trips to see him on the weekend and visit with him, and he, we would always find him alone in his room and isolated from everyone else. Case managers and doctors were of no help to us. Everyone meant well, but this was a new and rapidly growing phenomenon. The, and the system was starting to strain under the pressure. Then in 2008, we had genetic testing done. All four of my children had blood work and other tests run to determine if there was any genetic link. They tested for things like Fragile X, prater willi Rett syndrome, celiac disease, anything that's misdiagnosed or that mimics autism. The results were all negative, but the geneticist who had this protocol also tested for heavy metal toxicity. My children, especially Joshua and Jeremy, were off the charts in heavy metal toxicity. They asked other questions to determine the sources of possible metal exposure, things like silver fillings. There were none of those. They had never had a cavity. The genetists informed me that the vaccines were the culprit. Soon after that, an attorney for vaccine injury contacted us. There was a class action lawsuit that we became a part of with over 5,000 litigants in this one particular suit. There were other suits going on at the same time. All school and medical records were submitted, family history and school records. We must have been getting very close because soon afterwards they ran a smear campaign on Dr. Andrew Wakefield and a few, within a few days I was getting a call from the attorney saying that all autism related court cases against vaccine manufacturers were being dismissed. No discovery, no witness testimony, just dismissed without recourse. This was when I finally called my sister-in-law who I hadn't spoken to in years. She came right over and she introduced the GAPS diet to me. And she didn't stop there. She took me to Whole Foods and walked me through the store showing me what my children could have and what they could not have. Then she came over to the house and taught me how to make cultured vegetables and she was teaching me how to make kombucha. She would call me to check on me. She became Jeremy's standby guardian. So as we started Jeremy on the GAPS diet, 
So we started Jeremy on the GAPS diet. We were one of the lucky ones. We found a residential placement which was very much like a home setting. It was an apartment with a roommate. He would be at day services during the day and have staff there with him in the evenings and weekends. This was as independent of a life that Jeremy could ever possibly lead. This wonderful couple who are the residential providers agreed to allow me to choose his treatment as long as I could get a doctor to sign. They were also chefs, so the special diet he was on, they took extra care to make sure it was prepared in such a way that it was pleasing and tasteful. They were just as excited about it as I was. We weaned Jeremy off all medications and started the GAPS diet. Within weeks, the seizures disappeared. Within a month, the aggression was at a minimum. Jeremy was improving every day and you could see it happening. There are just some things that have not improved though because Jeremy can still not talk. So what I've learned through the GAPS diet and implementing cultured and fermented foods is that while vaccines are the greatest assault on an underdeveloped immune system, the generational depletion of good gut flora is also a factor in what we are seeing today as an explosion of autism. They are also attacking us right and left with fluoride, chemtrails, GMOs, pesticides, microwaves. It's everywhere around us and it's not by accident. There are too many children who are sick for the doctors to not notice this on their patient rosters. There are too many children having adverse reactions to vaccines and there are too many doctors who are ignoring this. You must ask yourself, why? When you see the CD, CDC and the FDA and the American Academy of Pediatrics and the pharmaceutical companies all in bed together, you must realize that the only interest here is to make a profit. In the end, this is one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make and if something goes wrong, you and your child will have to live with this for the rest of your life. You can never unvaccinate your child. There may be some hope with detoxing, but why would any parent put their child through that? As you're researching and investigating the safest car seat and the safest high chair, read the package insert on these vaccinations that your child is receiving as well as their ba at, at their baby check well baby checkups and realize that this is where there is no that this is there more to condition you to the idea of an immunization schedule. Genevieve and Sean are normal and healthy, typically developed children. They have never had a vaccination and they are rarely sick. When you eat clean and live clean, you end up with a healthier immune system. I've seen the health improve in my autistic children only when implementing a clean organic diet. Before that, with all the medications and the medical, that the medical field has to offer, I only saw deterioration. So will you listen what I have to say? Will you think about the future and who stands to make a profit? You are your child's only advocate. It is the parent who loves the child and has their best interest at heart. My prayer is that you will make an informed decision before you consent to vaccinating your child. Thank you.